Hi, everyone, and welcome to Book Break. My name is Claire. I'm a librarian here at the Greece Public Library, and I moderate As the Page Turns, which is a book club, and I purchase our adult nonfiction. Today, I have a very special guest, my daughter, Sarah. We have been reading books together as adults since 2016, and during the pandemic, we both joined Book of the Month Club to pick a book and then read it together. So sometimes our discussion consists of... (laughs) I like it, did you? (laughs) But I still feel that there are benefits to reading the same book with your adult child. So, hi, Sarah. Do you want to introduce yourself? Hello. My name is Sarah. Uh, I am Claire's daughter, as she mentioned. Uh, A longtime reader. I grew up in the the Trilight Public Library, so another Rochester Public Library. Big fan of reading and excited to be here. Thank you. So I think reading the same books as you is, it's a good way to kind of get an insight into your world without interrogating you about something directly, (laughs) which with your adult children is always good. Um, So it keeps me on the loop too, with some new trends. And I don't know, I feel like it gives us a good way to discuss things. How about you? I think it's fun because sometimes it makes me read different things. Mm -hmm. Sometimes none of the books speak to me, but one speaks to you. So I order it and then I'm pleasantly surprised. It's also fun when we don't like a book because sometimes talking about books you don't like is almost more fun. (laughs) Oh, this is very true. And I think the listeners like to hear that too. (laughs) All right. So... I am going to start with my first one. I don't think you've read this one, but it is called Take My Hand by Dolores Perkins Valdez. And I just finished this one for book club in October. And it is inspired by true events. It is set in Montgomery, Alabama in 1973. You know how mama likes her Southern fiction. I do. Um, Yes. And Sybil Townsend is fresh out of nursing school. She has big plans to make a difference, especially in her African-American community. And she starts working at the Montgomery Family Planning Clinic. So she feels like she wants to take, let women make decisions about their bodies, stay healthy, and give them better lives. But her first week on the job, she takes on her first client. She's driving down a dusty road finds a one-room cabin, and she's shocked to learn that her two patients are two young children, girls just 11 and 13. Neither one of these Williams sisters have ever kissed a boy, but they are poor and black, and for those handling the family's welfare benefits, that's reason enough to have the girls on birth control. So Sybil is kind of grappling with this role, and she takes the two girls, India and Erica, and their whole family, and she tries to take them into her heart and kind of better their life, and for lack of a better word, until one day she arrives at the door to learn the unthinkable has happened. So this book is based on a real case where two young sisters were sterilized without their consent or knowledge in 1973 wow. Montgomery. So it's not what I would say... You know, it's a pretty dark read. It's a dark history, and she delves into some other, um, like Sybil, the nurse, went to Tuskegee Institute, which had another very dark history with um, the men and the syphilis experiment. So the way she, she does this book is she's talking to her adult daughter. Like, Sybil, it goes from the future, which is like 2016, and her adult daughter, and Sybil is now a physician, as was her father. Okay. Um, so she's trying to teach, like, the lessons of the past so that she knows a little bit about her history. Um, the thing I liked about it is I thought the author really did her research in the book and brought to light something that a lot of people in the book group weren't even aware of. Um, and we all talked about that, like how a lot of the history we learn is incomplete, Um, Mm -hmm. or one-sided. So, but the thing I hated, or not hated, that's kind of a strong word, but didn't like is Sybil really punished herself so much, like her, her guilt. And it really was a circumstance 
that was out of her control. Like she did everything she could for these girls. She wouldn't have known what was going to happen until she actually was brave enough to start investigating. She was fired from her clinic and found out that this wasn't just a one-time occurrence. It was happening all over the state and probably all over the the South. I wouldn't, you know, be surprised. And funded by the U.S. government. So, um, as many things are. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so yeah, it was a. I think it was a great book for a book discussion. You might like it because you know it, it is a, an interesting part of history, but it wasn't what I would call an easy read, you know? Yeah. So what is your first one? Are you going to take us in a more positive direction? Uh, my first one is, is one I liked. I don't, I don't know that it's a light novel, <laughs> um, but it was the, the many lives of a Fong Moy. Uh, so that was a historical fiction that we both read based on a real life person, um, a Chinese woman who was brought over to the States kind of as like entertainment Mm -hmm. at a time when there weren't a lot of Chinese people in the States, especially Chinese women. There were a lot of male Chinese laborers. So they sort of paraded her around. Um, There's a lot of mystery to the circumstances of when she stopped acting. So the author kind of took that and and spun it up into this story about her kind of fictional descendants. Um, and it was a an alternating timeline, which I always really like, where you get multiple perspectives on the same thing. Um, the thing I really liked about it, it had a lot of themes talking about like the agency of women and how that's evolved over time. So you got to see how that kind of played out and how the things that happened to past generations impacted future generations. Um, it was really interesting to see kind of there was a modern character that was in San Francisco. So that was interesting because it was a real parallel. But they also went into two generations ahead. So you got to see their projections of kind of a dystopian climate change influenced future and how that might look as well. So it kind of spanned the gamut. Um, the only gripe I had was that it was slightly confusing and I noticed a lot of folks even on like the Reddit book communities were trying to lay out timelines of who was actually related to who. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you get hung up on those kinds of details, it may not be your calling, but it was definitely an interesting way to span kind of a, a big period period of pist- history from Chinese exclusion all the way through the present day and what the future might look like. Yeah. And that author, Jamie Ford, I believe that you and I read like when we first started reading books together, we read, what was it? Hotel on the Corner of Bitter and Sweet. He wrote that one too. He did. So, awesome. Yeah, I haven't finished Day Fong Moi. I'm going to be honest here. So, oh. Yes, yes. I did not know that. <laughs> yeah, did you gonna, get lost in the... Yeah, the I kind of got lost meter. in the shuffle, but I am going to pick it back up. Um I like the fact that it brought in, you said it brought in like future generations and climate change because I'm real into that right now. Although this. I did at one point stop trying to figure out who was descended from whom and just embraced the individual stories. I would say that is the path. Okay. (laughs) Just go with it. Do you need like a set period of time to like sit down and really concentrate on this book? I would say yes, because they do tie together certain memories from the different people. Okay. All right. Well, this next one we definitely both read, and I think we both liked it, and you might have liked this one better than I did. This was a very popular book not long ago. It was an Oprah's pick. It's called Hello Beautiful by N. Napolitano. It has an absolutely gorgeous, striking cover. Um, I think you posted something with your nails that day, like your nails oh, they matched, <laughs> matched, you know, a color in the book. Um, so our main character is William Waters. He grew up in a house and that was silenced by tragedy. This isn't a spoiler. His younger sister died and his parents never really got over that fact. And they never were really able to emotionally accept William. So he... They didn't parent at all. No, no. And he felt very excluded. And his only saving grace, I guess, when he was growing up is he discovered basketball. And he liked the camaraderie of the team. And he ended up earning a scholarship to play in college far away from where he lived so he could kind of get away from this 
very depressing family situation. And he ends up getting hurt, but he meets a young woman named Julia Padovano his freshman year. And this is a young lady that knows what she wants. And what she wants is William to be her husband. She wants him to go to graduate school and become a professor. And she's just going to give him the family he never had and, and all the love. But is this really what William needs or wants? <laughs> he doesn't know. <laughs> uh, no, he doesn't know. And he just kind of goes along with it because I think he's so swept up with Julia and her exuberant sisters and all their different personalities and having this wonderful, close family of boisterous people around. Um, but I think what happens is you know, the darkness from his past starts to come back into his life. And William makes a horrible choice and jeopardizes not only Julia's carefully orchestrated plans for their life, um, but also the sister's unshakable kind of connection to each other. So there is, it, this is a hard book to talk about without spoilers. You know, I don't it, know it how, is. how much to go into, but as a result, there's like a catastrophic family rift. And, you know, to me, this was a really sad book. I know that there were supposed to be a lot of parallels with the sisters and um, little women, you know, and one of them is artistic and one of them is very um, home oriented, very caring. She kind of nurtures everybody. Um, and then there's the older, you know, sister, well, Julia herself, who is extremely driven, very goal oriented person. So I could kind of see it. Um, and I will think about these characters for a long time. But I personally, like some people really love this book. Like my old roommate from college, Tracy, she loved this book. You know, yeah. Oprah loved this book. Did you love this book? I do, I do think I hearted this book on Book of the Month. <laughs> I don't know that I would like five out of five this book, but I would strong four out of five it. Yeah. Yeah, I would definitely say, like, the writing is excellent and really draws you in, and it's extremely emotional. Like, if you like an emotional read um, with more complex characters, these were not – the problems they were looking at were not what I would call – like a typical romance novel kind of problems, you know. Um. I also liked, and this is not a spoiler, I liked that they didn't force a perfect resolution. Yeah. There is an end. It's not a cliffhanger. It is resolved, but it's not, everything is not perfect. It's not like, oh, they crammed in the fairy tale ending that was clearly never to be. It was a realistic ending. Yeah, no, there was, there was no fairy tale ending here. There was a realistic ending. There was a somewhat hopeful ending. You know, you yeah. can see a path for the future, but you know, this is, yeah, no, this is definitely not a romance happily ever after kind of book. But the only other comment I had is, I think it was supposed to be set in the 1980s. I felt like it was more like the 60s. Like, I, I thought the family vibe was a little were, off for that time period. To me, they were a little yeah, bit Yeah, they made them very conservative with yes. the Catholic mother. Yes. Like the whole Catholic mom and, and the statues and all that stuff, you know. I thought that seemed more longer ago. But So what's your next one? Uh, my last one, I think, is still one of my contenders for my favorite books of the year. It was The the Last Russian Doll. Um, and I originally picked this up from Book of the Month because I had read The Master and Margarita earlier in the year. So I was hankering for some additional Russian fiction. Um, but it kind of exceeded my expectations. It, it has a very pretty cover, speaking of beautiful cover art. Um, and it was almost like a an adult fairy tale. So mm -hmm. she uses fairy tales and like the imagery of the dolls throughout the novel to kind of move the plot along. Um, but this one also, it sent, it centers women um, much like a Fung Moi and the uh, um, hello beautiful. It tells the story of a girl that's growing up in the UK um, and her mother has 
taken her with her when she defected from Russia because of the mysterious murder of um, the girl's father and sister. And then it kind of starts telling two parallel stories as she gets a job and goes back to Russia to look into this murder of her in the current day. And then a story in the past during the Bolshevik revolution. And you're kind of watching them get slowly tied together through these fairy tales and these odd porcelain dolls. And it's like, it's sort of almost magical realism. It's like slightly bizarre, um, but it's definitely set in a real world scenario. She does a really nice job layering in the history I thought as well. Yeah, and there's something about, like, I like historical fiction, and you actually recommended and let me read your copy of this book. Yeah. There's not a lot of what I would call, like, good Soviet fiction or Russian fiction, right. and especially one that's so detailed and brought in so many great characters. Um, and it kind of brought in almost, like, mystery a little bit with uh, what happened to the the father and how she's going to find out like how all of these people and these threads are going to come together. And I could almost imagine those dolls. I would have rather them been like the nesting dolls, but the porcelain, you know, <laughs> it was particularly creepy imagery. <laughs> it was, it was, especially when you found out like who was behind them. So yeah, yeah, it was, <laughs> but no, that was a good one. I like that one too. And I think that one has been on my favorites are on my radar for one of my better reads this year definitely one of my best historical fiction reads so all right so my next one which i gave you to read as well was clytemnestra and it's uh it was a debut novel um got through book of the month by costanza casati and I love this book. This one is definitely one, one of my favorites for the year. And it has sent me into the rabbit hole of Greek mythology retellings, which now I've read <laughs> like a couple. But um, this one, Clytemnestra is a lesser known character in comparison to her sister, who is Helen of Troy. Her father is the king of Sparta. And, you know, Clytemnestra has been raised as a princess of Troy and is married to someone she truly loves. I'm trying to think of his name from Mycenae. And then something horrible happens to him and their son. And another king decides that he wants her. And this is Agamemnon, I think. So he takes her as his He's wife. a real dirtbag. Oh, yeah. He is a, a <laughs> true dirtbag in every sense of the word. Um takes her she has children and meanwhile she's just like biding her time she has never truly forgotten what happened to her what happened to her first husband her son and um she is going to find revenge and that was pretty satisfying to read about so um she's a very complex character but i think what put her over the edge and hopefully this isn't a spoil like agamemnon actually sacrifices one of their children so he can have wind to go into the battle of troy and that is when clytemnestra like loses her you know what and is just she's done so yes. um yeah so that was the only thing that kind of dragged a little bit was waiting of course for him to come back from the battle of troy which lasted forever it's it seemed like but um yeah very feministic take i think yeah. on on the greek mythology and instead of feeling like when she finally does get her revenge which she does um you you know why you know why she did it she's not like an evil queen you're actually rooting for clytemestra like all the way <laughs> to get get what she uh has so yes i love this one and the author does provide like a family tree in the beginning and a glossary of terms which were helpful and i was a little bit worried because i started reading all these names and thinking there is no way i'm going to be able to keep this straight but really you do and i don't even know how you do the but characters are very compelling right um so it's almost like you're not even having to keep track of the names you know who she's talking about and you can follow yeah. the story um, so, yeah, I was totally immersed in that one. So, did you have one more? I'm trying to... I also, I, I also liked that uh, Clytemnestra. It it would have been ha ha very at home right alongside, uh, like, the Count of Monte Cristo. Oh, wow. 
Okay. You watch their vengeance just like steep and steep and steep. <laughs> and it couldn't not be satisfying. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Uh, I do have one more. I saved my least favorite book of the year for last. Um, so I started my year off with a bang with the Lincoln Highway, which I think was a contender for book of the year last year. I believe it. Books it was have seen something I didn't. I think you ordered this and didn't read it because of my despising it. So <laughs> Right. And um, as I mentioned, my old partner, Kirstra, she read another book by this author, Amor Tells. It was A Gentleman in Moscow. And she hated that book. Which is supposed book. to be very good. I know. Oh, well, she hated it? <laughs> oh, yeah. She hated it. Said it drag, you know, different things. Um, so yeah, let's, was, let's hear what you have to say about Lincoln Highway. It was very strange. So it's a, a coming of age novel of sorts, I would say. And it starts off the main character is a teenager he is getting out of basically juvie he's in like a penitentiary for young boys it's not really a prison it's like a work camp sort of deal in arkansas um and he's supposed to be starting his life over he's getting his life back but he's going back to the home where he grew up and his father has died so he has this younger brother they don't ever say that he has like it, like autism or anything like specific but it's clear that the brother like needs him one because he's eight and he needs someone to take care of him but two also like is very dependent upon him for like social cues and other things mm -hmm. so they're supposed to be starting their life over they have this whole grand plan to move west and buy real estate and rebuild houses in california and then two of his other friends show up they have broken out of the prison um and are just like derailing their plans left and right. So somehow they end up from their plan of driving west to California to driving northeast to New York to pursue one of the other characters inheritance that is locked away in this cabin. It gets very bizarre very quickly. And it's switching from point of view to point of view of each of these young boys. The one is clearly a sociopath. But it's sort of dragging. It's very slow paced. It's very thorough. It's explaining each of their actions very like explicitly from each of their point of views. And then all of a sudden in the last 60 pages, it's like the author got as sick of writing this book as I did of reading it. And he just slapdashes an ending together <laughs> that left me completely befuddled. <laughs> <laughs> that is too funny. Um, I don't think you were alone in that assessment. I, I saw mixed things. It seems to be a book that people either really love or hate. And once you started talking about it, I realized I did start this book because I remember when he came home and came home to the, you know. Yeah. So I, I probably will at some point have this book on my stack of shame and feel compelled to read it. So because I bought it and it stares baefully at me at, from my shelf. But the the ending is very bizarre in terms of the character development that's set up from the rest of the book. Okay. The characters make the the one main character that the book starts with makes a decision that is so out of line with everything they've kind of tried to like set up about his character growth that it just felt so bizarre to me. Okay. Hmm. It's still bothering me. It's been almost 12 months. <laughs> <laughs> and you can hold a grudge. So. Yes. So what are you reading? Are you, what are you reading right now? Anything good? I just finished the new RF Quang book, The Ye uh, Yellow Face. Yes, I talked about that one uh, a couple of episodes ago. Yeah, that one was, uh, that was a very interesting read. So did you did you discuss Babel? Because you you did not particularly love Babel. Yes, yes, we discussed that one too. And Mama like put all her thoughts like right out there. <laughs> RF Quang makes me feel stupid. That that's basically uh, the way I feel about. She is very smart. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm reading Sharkheart, which you said you finished. I did finish Sharkheart. Sharkheart was sort of bizarre, but kind of delightful. Yes, yes, it's very hard to explain. It's like the, one of the most unusual premises I've ever read, but for some reason I can't stop reading. How far are you? Well, he's she's released him. The, the okay. premise of the book, and this isn't a spoiler, is she, the young woman, her name is Ren, gets married, and then her husband gets a diagnosis 
not long after they're married, right? Like right after they get married. They yeah. haven't left for their honeymoon. Yeah, that he's turning into a great white shark, literally. Yeah. I think, it, I guess I, I, never, I didn't look up any discussion on the book or anything with the author, so this might be like wild conjecture, but I sort of felt like it was an allegory for like terminal illness. I, I'm, I'm kind of feeling the same. You know, like it, 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 you can use the parallels for how she's coping with this yeah. with someone that would be, you know, like having a spouse die of some traumatic event, you know. So, yeah, it's good. I, it might even end up in one of my more interesting books of the year, a debut, very unusual premise. And the way she's executed it is, is different, but it's good. It is definitely the strangest book I read this year. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining joining me today, Sarah, and um, for reading with me throughout the year. I really appreciate it. As always, all the links to the books that we talked about today are going to be in our show notes. And join us in December when my fellow librarian Jenna and I will talk about our favorite books of 2022. So, ooh, yes, tune into that one too, Sarah. <laughs> So thanks. Have a happy Thanksgiving, everyone, and we will see you soon. Bye. Thanks for having me. Oh, you're welcome. Book Break is a production of the Grease Public Library, made possible through the support of the Friends of the Grease Public Library. Theme music composed and performed by Sean Greif.